Good afternoon. It's Tuesday, February 24th. I'm Laura Cornfield, and this is IBA News broadcasting from Jerusalem. Fears are growing that an agreement in the making with Iran in the West over its disputed nuclear program could leave the Islamic Republic with the ability to manufacture an atomic weapon. IBA's Margot Dudkevich reports. The U.S. and Iran reported progress in talks over Tehran's disputed nuclear program at the conclusion of the two-day meeting in Geneva. Reports suggest a deal is already in the making that will leave Iran with some 6,500 centrifuges. While few details have emerged, the focus by all those involved in the talks appears to be on reaching a compromise. Progress was made, U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry said before leaving Geneva. Delegations from the P5 plus one countries, the United States, Britain, China, France, Germany, Russia and Iran are scheduled to convene again next week. Iran's Foreign Minister Mohammad Javad Zarif summed up the recent round of talks saying the sides have found a better understanding at the negotiating table. The key parties, especially Washington and Tehran, are moving uh, closer towards each other. They are taking steps towards each other. Uh, as far as uranium enrichment is concerned. So this reflects the uh, strong sentiments on both capitals for, a, agree, for an agreement. Israel blasted the deal. Defense Minister Moshe Yalond warned the agreement being consolidated not only threatens Israel's security, but is a danger to peace in the Western world. If the deal is signed, it will allow Iran to become a nuclear threshold state, he said. Reports filtering out from Geneva suggest a proposal being considered will limit Iran's ability to produce nuclear material for some 10 years, but will see the lifting of sanctions after five years. During this period, the Islamic Republic will be subjected to harsh restrictions and around-the-clock monitoring of its nuclear activities. Accordingly, the Islamic Republic will have to ship out enriched uranium it produces or change to a form that will make it difficult to convert for weapon use. However, once the deal expires, Iran will theoretically be able to ramp up its uranium enrichment to higher levels. No mention was made concerning the heavy water reactor in Iraq or the enrichment facility in Bordeaux. If the sides agree to a preliminary deal in March to be signed and sealed by the end of June, it appears it will not succeed in curbing Iran's nuclear weapons potential. Margot Dudkevich, IBA News. In the past, the IAEA has repeatedly said that Iran has been stalling in providing information and access to some area of its nuclear program. Believe it or not, the Iranians say they are ready to move faster in their cooperation. We uh, decided to uh, expand and expedite our cooperation on different issues that uh, we have uh, in our hand and uh, we appreciate uh, the goodwill and sense of cooperation which, which exists between the two sides and we decide uh, to build on that and proceed on our cooperation with the agency in all different fields. We acknowledge the important role of the agency in, in any possible agreement in the future and we try to uh, in fact, adjust uh, the course of cooperation between the two sides in order to cover that one as well. Israeli officials say there is nothing new or secret in the leaked cables from the South African Secret Service, reportedly showing that Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's views on Iran's nuclear weapons program are not shared by the Mossad spy intelligence agency. The cables were published by the British Guardian newspaper, but their so-called sensation leaves viewers wondering, where's the beef? The Palestinian Authority has blasted a decision by a U.S. federal court that orders them to pay more than $218 million in damages to American victims of six terrorist attacks in Israel over a decade ago. The court ruling comes at a time when the PA has asked to join the International Criminal Court in The Hague to bring war crime charges against Israel. We get more on the story from IBA's Ari O'Sullivan. It took less than two days of deliberations for the 12-member jury at the U.S. federal court in New York 
to decide that the Palestinian Authority and the PLO were liable for supporting six terrorist attacks in Israel during the Second Intifada in the early 2000s. The case was filed by U.S. families affected by the bombings, carried out by the Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigade and Hamas, which killed 33 people and wounded over 400 others. The suit was filed under the U.S. Anti-Terrorism Act, which means that the $218 million in damages awarded to the victims could be tripled because it involved an act of terrorism. Attorneys representing the 10 families were pleased with the verdict. This is, this is a great day for, for our country. It's a great day for those who fight terror. Um, we're so proud of our families who stood up and uh, we're so impressed with how seriously the jury took their job. It's really, uh, really amazing, very humbling. The Palestinians have said that they plan to appeal the decision, saying they had no involvement in the attacks and shouldn't be held responsible for actions of a handful of extremists. Chairman of the PLO's International Affairs Department, Hassan Shaka, told reporters that the verdict was political because America was biased toward Israel. Nitzan Darshan Leitner, a co-counsel for the plaintiffs, said the PA knows that there is a price to pay for sending suicide bombers against innocent people. Now the PA, the Palestinian Authority, knows that there is a price for sending suicide bombers to our malls, to our cafes, and blowing our buses up. And we will pursue and we'll make sure that the PA will pay every dollar of this judgment. It's unclear how the compensation would be paid given the PA's dire economic straits, but it could lead to going after PA's assets in the U.S. We're going to take steps against their assets. They have assets in the United States, in Israel. We're going to go after uh, bank accounts and money that they are uh, getting paid on a monthly basis in Israel, for instance. Uh, and we're going to put, a, put pressure on those who are uh, negotiate with them, who those who have a uh, relationship with them, to make sure that the Palestinian Authority respects the American law, respects an American uh, uh, jury ruling, and pay their debt. Yeah, it's about accountability. It's about justice. As I said to the jury, um, there's nothing that can bring the loved ones back. Money has to stand in for other things because that's the only power this jury had. But the jury sent a very clear message that, uh, that uh, those who commit terror against Americans will be held accountable in a United States court of law. The decision comes just a couple of months after the Palestinian Authority joined the International Criminal Court, paving the way for them to charge Israeli officials with war crimes. The verdict in New York shows that there is a price to pay for involving courts in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Both the Israeli government and the Palestinian Authority closely followed the PLO trial. Not surprisingly, Israel celebrated the ruling while the Palestinians vowed to appeal. U.S. federal court holds the Palestinian Authority and its leadership directly accountable for numerous acts of terrorism against innocent civilians, Israelis and Americans. Now this is an important message to the Palestinian leadership which must cease praising terrorism and break its pact with the terrorist group Hamas. Now, Palestinian leaders have traveled the world telling people they've renounced terrorism. It's time that they finally followed through. We believe that we have a good case. We do believe that we will win the appeal. We do believe that if we are able to present all the evidence, in a court of appeal and to discuss also the jurisdiction of the court on these cases, then we will win. And the Oscar goes to, well, that was yesterday's news, but Israeli UN Ambassador Ron Prosser used his appearance at the World Body to announce his own version of the awards. Last night, Hollywood celebrated the Oscars, and as millions tuned in, I thought of the following. If the Oscars for maintenance of international peace and security were given at the UN, I would not be surprised if these candidates were awarded prizes. In the best actor category for acting like a, like a peace-loving country while developing nuclear capabilities, denying the Holocaust and threatening the destruction of another member state, the Oscar goes to Iran. In the category for best supporting actor for its unrelenting support to the Assad regime, in killing hundreds of thousands of civilians, the Oscar goes to Hezbollah. In the category for best visual effects, for making women disappear from public squares, the Oscar goes to, surprise, surprise, Saudi Arabia. No competition there. 
And finally, for rewriting history, the Oscar for best editing goes to the Palestinian Authority. But the truth is that the Palestinian Authority already received enough prizes from this institution. Mr. President, Oscar aside, if we want to pursue peace and security in the real world, it's time to bring down the curtain on this theater of the absurd and return to the original values of the UN Charter back to center stage. The intrigue surrounding Prime Minister Netanyahu's speech to Congress next week continues. Two senior U.S. Senate Democrats invited Prime Minister Netanyahu to a closed-door meeting after warning that making U.S.-Israel relations a partisan political issue could have lasting repercussions. Senators Richard Durbin and Dianne Feinstein extended the invitation to Netanyahu in order to maintain Israel's dialogue with both political parties in Congress. Netanyahu faces criticism at home and abroad for his plans to address Congress on Iran's nuclear program just two weeks before Israeli elections. Netanyahu accepted the invitation to address Congress from Republican leaders without consulting the Democrats in Congress or the Obama administration. The decision caused many Democrats to announce that they would absent themselves from Netanyahu's speech. Senators Feinstein and Durbin issued a statement saying that the Netanyahu speech to Congress sacrifices deep and well-established cooperation on Israel in order to score short-term partisan points, something that should never be done and which we fear could have lasting repercussions. A soldier was lightly to moderately wounded in the Dehesha refugee camp overnight. A 19-year-old Palestinian was killed during clashes between rioters and security forces. The disturbance erupted after troops deployed as part of an operation to locate a wanted man. Rioters threw stones and bricks at the soldiers from rooftops in the crowded neighborhood. After riot control methods failed to disperse the crowd, the troops opened fire. French President Francois Hollande has called on Google and Facebook to fight online hate speech. Speaking to a Jewish group in Paris, Hollande said that clear and precise guidelines must be put in place with the leading internet giants in order to reduce online anti-Semitic, racist, and homophobic expressions. Hollande said, there is no place for anti-Semitism in France. France knows it, France says it, and France shows it. And France says no to fanaticism and no to anti-Semitism. Hollande went on to say, Jews are at home in France, and it's the anti-Semites who have no place in the French Republic. Hollande promised that in the coming days, Prime Minister Manuel Valls will present a government plan to fight racism and anti-Semitism. Charlie Hebdo is back. More than a month after Islamic terrorists attacked the magazine, murdering 12 staff members, it has returned to its normal publication schedule. Charlie Hebdo did release a so-called survivor's issue that sold millions of copies the week after the January 7th attack, but since then the presses, printing presses, have been still. The front page of the new edition features caricatures of a pack of dogs depicted as cultural and political figures. They include the Pope and German Chancellor Angela Merkel as they chase a dog with a copy of the magazine in its mouth. Above these, there is an overline reading, Here We Go Again. Charlie Hebdo was targeted by Muslim gunmen because of its cartoons depicting the Prophet Muhammad. The Islamic State will be defeated through a concerted diplomatic and military effort. That's the word from new U.S. Secretary of Defense Ashton Carter after talks with diplomatic and military leaders at a U.S. military base in Kuwait. Achieving the lasting defeat of ISIL will require a combined diplomatic and military effort. Uh, that was abundantly confirmed by our discussion and was affirmed, or rather affirms, uh, the bringing together of this unique um, grouping of political and military leaders. British Prime Minister David Cameron has spoken out on the case of three British schoolgirls who are believed to be in Syria after being lured by online extremists. Cameron told Parliament that all sectors of society have a role to play in preventing radicalization of young people. British teenagers appear to have been radicalized and duped by this poisonous ideology of Islamist extremism while at home on the internet in their bedrooms. They appear to have been induced to join a terrorist group that carries out the most hideous violence and believes girls should be married at nine and women should not leave the home. Their families are understandably heartbroken and we must do all that we can to help. 
Mr Speaker, we should be clear that this is not just an issue for our police and border controls. Everyone has a role to play in preventing our young people being radicalised, whether that is schools, colleges, universities, families, religious leaders and local communities. Back here at home, after serving two-thirds of an eight-year sentence for attempted rape and sodomy, the one-time bodyguard of former IDF Chief of General Staff Gabi Ashkenazi has been released from prison. Erez Efrati, who was convicted in a plea bargain agreement in 2010, refused to speak to media who waited outside the Hermon jail after his release, but his attorney said that his client was a model prisoner and expressed remorse for his crime. 35-year-old Efrati confessed to the attempted rape of a 23-year-old victim at the Tel Aviv port, which took place just after he and his friends celebrated his bachelor party at a nearby strip club. During his trial, Efrati claimed that he was unaware of his actions due to excessive alcohol consumption on the night of the attack. Efrati paid the victim 150,000 shekels. The Bank of Israel made a surprising move yesterday and dropped interest rates to a record low of one-tenth of a percent. Acting on interest rates for the first time in six months, Bank of Israel Governor Karnit Flug pushed the rate down to a level not experienced since 2005. The Bank of Israel released a statement saying that the decision is due to continuing declines in consumer prices, recent shekel appreciation, and lower interest rates globally. A new reform from the Ministry of Communications promises to save the public a great deal of money. The broadband policy reform will allow consumers to get both their infrastructure and their internet from the same supplier. Currently, consumers must get infrastructure from either Hot or Bezek. The move could lower prices by some 25% for telecom services. Bezek is opposed to the reform and claim that the change is complicated and slow. Bezek also says that the new providers cannot offer the same level of technical service. Doctors at Ichilov Hospital are unhappy about the rate of accidents on electric bicycles and they decided to do something about it. Four physicians took part in a new video campaign filmed at the facility's trauma department where they call on the public to start paying attention to the lack of driving culture associated with these vehicles. There are an estimated 100,000 electric bikes being used here in the country, and according to the Or Yorok Road Safety Organization, about 700 people are injured each year from accidents involving the bikes. The message from the medical staff is that it's time to wake up and for the authorities to start enforcing the law to end these needless accidents. And great news for outdoor enthusiasts, the Israel Nature and Parks Authority is inaugurating 50 new hiking routes around the country as part of its 50th anniversary celebrations. The routes will be divided into several categories such as family trails, paths for the physically challenged, bicycle paths, and routes for all-terrain vehicles. The official launch will take place during Nature Conservation Week, which is scheduled between February 27th and March the 7th. The Nature and Parks Authority will operate information booths in all the country's nature sites where the public can find out about activities that are taking place during that week. We all know the frustration of trying to find parking places in built-up areas. A new Israeli app called Anagog is making waves as it appears to be successfully tackling the problem. The Tel Aviv startup uses real-time crowdsourcing data from mobile phones. What ways is done for navigation, Anagog wants to do for parking. Getting where you need to go has gotten a lot easier lately, huh? But what do you do when you get there and there is simply nowhere to park your car? Really nowhere. You just sit there behind the wheel and watch your valuable time go to waste. Ever get so frustrated you're about to explode? Well, parking is about to get a whole lot easier with Anagog. The unique parking application that will save you a lot of time and energy. Anagog automatically recognizes when parking spots are about to be cleared. Our unique software actually detects when drivers are walking towards their parked cars and alerts you about it in advance. So you can arrive there early and catch the spot before it has actually been cleared. And parking gets a whole lot easier. Anagog analyzes the accumulated parking events over time and provides you with minute-to-minute -minute detailed statistics of your chances to find parking anywhere in the city, helping you to smartly choose your route no matter where you are.
And as a developer, you have access to our technology along with an easy to integrate software development kit. Check it out. Sports News, 13,000 fans got their money's worth last night at Bloomfield Stadium when they watched a two-all draw between Apoel Tel Aviv and Maccabi Haifa in Premier League soccer action. Both teams opened slowly, but things took a turn in the 29th minute when Eliran Atar scored the first of his two goals for Haifa. Shlomi Azulai evened the score for the host just nine minutes later. Both teams opened the second half with a vengeance, with Atar scoring from close range in the 52nd minute. But the goal of the match definitely belonged to game MVP Ben Reichardt with his sensational kick from 20 meters out in the 72nd minute. The draw earned only one point for each of the teams and harms both teams' chances of making it to the playoffs. In local money matters, the shekel was down in foreign currency trading while shares were mixed on the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange. Here are the late afternoon numbers. And the IBA weather team is predicting a drop in temperatures tomorrow with chances of light rain. Here are the highs and lows for the next 24 hours at home and abroad. And that's all for this newscast. Aaron Viner will be here tomorrow with more news from Israel and abroad. Until then, I'm Laura Cornfield wishing you a good evening and shalom from Jerusalem.